Oh my goodness, what's going on, you guys? I am Ian Martin Allison. I'm here by myself for The Scott and Ian Show. You're saying, uh, I thought this was called The Scott and Ian Show. Where's Scott? Scott's on vacation. Um, I think he calls it holiday with his family. Uh, and so he was like, hey, man. He's like, I ended up doing a, uh, a solo show, and that may have come out last week. He said, so why don't you man up? do a solo show. So <laughs> I took the opportunity to ask uh, for questions on Instagram and I got so many questions. Thank you to everyone who asked a question. I literally got hundreds of questions and going through them was a chore, not gonna lie, but also really great. And there were a lot of really great questions. I can't answer them all, of course, but I picked my favorite and there were a lot that were very similar, right? So I decided to sort of group those and hopefully uh, I'm gonna answer your question. And look, I debated on whether or not I was gonna like say the names of the people that asked the question. I'm not. I decided, <laughs> I don't know, I decided that it would be better this round to make the questions uh, anonymous. I think that's the correct word to use there. Um, and, you know, and if you're bummed out that your name doesn't get attached to your sweet questions, sorry, maybe I'll do it different next time. But I'm erring on the side of caution. There might be a couple of names I throw out. But we're going to get this show on the road and I wish I had like a like a sick like intro song to play and you'd be like, oh man, listen to that jingle. And maybe there already was one. Um, come on, guys. Cut me a little slack. Solo show. Scott and Ian show. B squad today. I'm bringing it in. <laughs> you just got me. So, hey, check this out. We're starting right here. Question number one. What made you start playing the bass? Check it out. I could tell you, oh, there was a band and they and I wanted to play the drums, but they needed a I'm not going to do that. <laughs> it's sort of true. But here's actually what happened. I was tall in the seventh grade and I was on the basketball team, not because of skill, but because I was just tall. I find myself with the ball, which is rare. I see the hoop. I'm like, oh, this is amazing. I take a shot it bounces off the rim and I get the rebound, which is weird. Now my family is up in the stands and they are cheering for me. The crowd is going wild. This is my moment. I take a second shot. I miss a second time. I get the rebound again, which was very odd. And suddenly it seemed like it was like not hard to get the rebound. And the crowd is going, Whoa! And I don't, I think they're like, Ian, you're the best. This is amazing. And I take a third shot. I miss a third time. And a player from the other team grabs the ball, lays it into the basket, and they go, thanks, and tap me on the arm. And I realize I'm shooting at the wrong basket all three times. I look up to my family in the stands. They are horrified, heads in hands. It was like one of the most embarrassing, terrible moments of my life. And after that game, I came to my mother and I said, Mom, I can't do this anymore. I can't do sports. I'm terrible at it. She said, well, you got to do something. And I said, I just want to play video games. She said, you can't play video games. And, I, and then there was a band, right? They maybe needed. And I had an uncle and a cousin, right, who played the bass. And I said, what about the stupid bass? And she said, okay. And then I fell in love with the bass. So that's actually how it happened. I came to the bass through being absolutely dismal at sports. Yeah. Hey, why is the jazz bass your favorite bass? Also, jazz bass front pickup on, back pickup off, go. What's the deal? I just happen to have a jazz bass right here. If you know me at all, you know that a jazz bass is kind of home bass for me, pun intended. Um, this is my Antigua bass. If you're watching this on SBL, you can see the video. If you're watching the video, if you're not, well, oh, sorry. Got it plugged in. Right, jazz bass. These are kind of old round wounds. But I love the way they sound. That's both pickups on full. Look, check this out. This is just neck pickup. It kind of leans P bass. Actually, that's the way I play it the most. Love that sound. And then, of course, you've got the rear pickup Jocko thing. I don't play it that way very much. Typically, I'm running that neck pickup almost soloed. 
all the time. I find that it leans P bass, but it still has like a little bit more clarity than a P bass, which uh, has more of like a hump in the mid range. Why do I love the jazz bass? There are so many reasons. Let's just rattle them off. I love how they look. I love the offset body. I like the neck profile, especially in the late 70s when they're a little bit thicker front to back, but still kind of thin at the nut. Um, I like the way they sound. I just, aesthetically, I just bonded with them very early, aesthetically and tonally, and I just fell in love. I bought this bass in the early 2000s, this Antigua 78 Antigua Jazz, and I don't know. It's not the best bass that I've ever played, but it's like the best bass for me. So I love a jazz bass. You don't have to love a jazz bass. Do you hate a jazz bass? Maybe you do. That's okay. Scott loves a P bass. Oh, it's just meant to be. We've got the Brit with the P bass and the American with the jazz bass. Come on. I'm way into it. So jazz bass forever for me. That doesn't mean, now, now look, that doesn't mean that I don't play a P bass when it calls for it. We're going to get into that a little later. Yeah, your boy plays a P bass when it calls for it. You think I'm just going to roll in with a jazz bass and just like, oh, this is the only thing I'm going to play. Like, if it doesn't matter or if I think the jazz is the right thing, I'm going to play it. But if a P bass is better for a tune in the studio, I've done entire tours on P basses when I first joined Eric Hutchinson. P basses are great too. I just feel more at home on a jazz. Top five influences. Ready? I, yeah, look, look, these aren't going to be the coolest influences. Like I'm not going to list off five things and you're going to be like, oh, this is, a, these are amazing. But this is just really true for me. Rush, huge influence for me. Oh, and I wasn't going to say this. I, should I? I wasn't going to say this next one, but it's just true. And I'm going to say it. Poison. I saw Bobby Dahl, the bass player for Poison, in a video rocking an open A in the tune Unskinny Bop, and that's what really made me want to be a bass player. That and that I suck at basketball. Um, yeah. Rush, Poison. Victor Wooten, for sure. Victor was the person that blew my mind when I first heard him play. I couldn't believe it. Uh, Victor, incredible. Um, then I'm also going to say Michelle and Deggy Ocello. I came to Michelle. If you've not heard Michelle's record, Plantation Lullabies, 1992, you're going to have to suffer through a little bit of like corny, like drum machine production, a little bit of corny, like guitar tone production. But that record is a masterpiece. Fight me. I love it so much. Check it out. Michelle and Deggy Ocello, Plantation Lullabies. Um, she really was uh, the bass player that I kind of got out of thinking about things just in terms of like a rock context. And she really got me into thinking about R&B, thinking about funk music. She even really turned me on to Prince. Like I heard her talking about Prince. I'm like, oh, I should really dig into Prince. Michelle, you're amazing. I love you very much. Um, then also, I have to say, my dear friend Dave Young, who taught me how to sing, my like childhood friend Dave Young, who was two years older than I was. We were in a band together. He is the best. I was like, dude, I can't. I, he's like, can you sing? I'm like, no, nah, no, nah, man, I can't. I can't sing. And he's like, yeah, you can. Everybody can sing. I said, no, 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 no. He's just like, Here, here's the thing. You just have to do it loud. He's like, sing like, oh, we're halfway there. And I went, Oh, no, he's like, you got to do it loud. And then we're in his truck, just like, oh. I mean, and it was amazing. He, Dave, you're, you're the greatest. I love you forever. Um, and then the artist that really got me into thinking about electronic music, hip hop music, um, and maybe a little bit more avant-garde production was Bjork. And I know that Bjork doesn't really line up with hip hop at all, but it's Bjork's music is what really got me thinking about like electronic and synth based sounds, which is a lot of the things that I do now. There we go. Those are my five influences. That may have been six. Sue me. How do you pick the right bass for the gig? Great question. Am I always just rolling in with the jazz bass? Am I Johnny Jazz Bass? No, I'm going to pick the right bass for the gig. In fact, I've got a gig coming up tomorrow that I'm playing a five string on. You're like, Ian, we've never seen you play a five. 
It's the right bass for the gig. Here's the deal. I think about it in terms of two things. How do you pick the right bass for the gig? Well, if you're fortunate enough to have basses to pick from, I mean, if, if you have one bass, that's your bass. <laughs> so you can, next question, right? But if you have a few different things and you're wondering, mm, what bass should I use for this particular thing? I think it's about an aesthetic look. Now, I'm going to say that first because I think people lie and say that, oh, like, oh, it just depends on how it sounds. Well, I'm not going to show up to a jazz brunch with a ding wall, right? I'm just not going to. But then I'm not going to show up to like a progressive rock or metal gig or session with a P bass with flats, right? So, you have to think about the look and also the tonal aesthetic as well, right? I mean, the ding wall is going to be the thing for the for the metal gig, right? And maybe something with flat ones for the jazz brunch, right? Um, also, I think references are really, really huge. So when I show up to a session, if I know anything about the artist and what they like, I'm going to pick an instrument based on the things that they like. If they've told me they like Elvis Costello, you know, I'm going to bring maybe a P bass and a Rickenbacker. Uh, I was just on the phone with an artist who was saying, oh, we're going to do this like sing-along folk record. I said, what's the bass vibe? Oh, something plunky and almost like a tuba. And I thought, oh, that's so interesting. Maybe it'll be a hollow body with flats, right? So ask the artist, ask the people, like, what's the vibe of this? And then get your references together. No. If someone says, oh, it needs to be like that Tame Impala thing, right? Know what that means and know how to bring that sound and vibe. Cool. Here we go. How have you found motivation during COVID times? Scott and I did an episode about motivation that you should check out if you are so inclined. Motivation is interesting because Scott would say that it's a secondary cause of something else. Scott talks about fear being a motivator, which I think is actually so true, right? Like you don't want to get left in the dust maybe, right? Or, um, and I think, I think about motivation a little bit more in terms of inspiration. So what I would do, um, I mean, we're still in COVID times. So I was so fortunate to get um, pulled into the SBL team. So that's just incredible. I get to make a lot of content. I get to do this podcast with Scott or solo show today. Uh, and so that, that actually gives me a ton of motivation because it's part of my job, but largely like creatively, the thing that fires me up is listening to something new. And that can be a bit of a vulnerable risk, right? Like maybe I'm listening to some new music. I'm just turning on the radio to a station that I love 89.3, the current in Minneapolis shout out. Uh, they play a ton of great music. I get a lot of inspiration from that. Um, sometimes I'll watch a movie and I'll just have a bass in hand and try to play along to the soundtrack. Or I've even done a thing where I've turned the sound off and played and tried to make up the soundtrack. Maybe fire up a reverb pedal and a fuzz. And I just watched Oblivion. You know that movie? Tom Cruise, dude? 2013? 14, maybe? Um, I turned the, and the soundtrack's super cool on that. Uh, I can't remember who did it. It doesn't matter. I ended up turning the sound off and, you know, made my own soundtrack. And that's really motivating and fun for me. So you just have to find things. I think um, if you're going to go with the inspiration route, you just have to find things that inspire you. What is that? Is it listening to something you've listened to a million times? Is it digging into something new? What is that for you that inspires you? Um, that's how I find motivation. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> what was an embarrassing thing that happened to you on stage that you laugh about now? I maybe have told this story on the podcast before, but it bears repeating. I was in Lori Line's band. Lori Line is a pianist in the Midwest. Christmas show, you guys. I'm dressed. We're doing costume changes, right? I'm, I'm also I'm playing upright. I'm playing the upright bass, which is not my first thing, as you, as you maybe know, if you know my playing at all. But I'm playing the upright bass because it was mostly an upright gig. That right there is hilarious. Um, I'm in my 20s. This is a long time ago. Uh, gosh, this is, you know, probably about 15 years ago. And I have, <laughs> I've got my bass. And I'm in a Dickens outfit, like Charles Dickens. So I've got a top hat on and a big fuzzy coat. And we're playing We Wish You a Merry Christmas. <laughs> Instrumental band, right? The piano player, Lori, is playing the melody on the piano. And she's a monster piano player. Um, but also like a hard-ass band leader. Like does not tolerate fools well. 
<laughs> now, the way it works in Lori Lyons' band is the melody goes around the band, right? So she plays it first. Right? And then it goes to the violinist. Right? And then it goes to the tuba player, Dave Buttimer. Dave Buttimer, you are a star. He's so rad. And he plays on the tuba. Amazing. And then as he's playing, I look over at Dave Buttermer and I think to myself, he's so good. I need to work on my melodies more. And as I thought that, it came to me. And when the melody came to me on the upright bass, it was band hits time. It was supposed to sound like boom, 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 boom. But if you've ever played Guitar Hero and you know how like it sounds when you start to mess up, <laughs> that's how it sounded. It was like <laughs> my hand went to the wrong position. I froze. I couldn't find it. It was an absolute fucking nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> and as the band hits are happening, Lori Line is looking at me with huge eyes and playing this stuff, and I am dying all over it. And I mean, it was so embarrassing. And then, I mean, I got the yips. I mean, for many, many shows after that, I struggled to play it because I would just like, I didn't want that to happen again. What I ended up doing was trying to focus on something that wasn't about me. So there are also some people that asked about stage performance and stage fright. This will address that. What I tried to do to get over that horrible experience was when that moment was coming up and I felt anxiety rising in me, I would dedicate my performance to someone in the audience. Instead of thinking, oh no, my bass solo is going to be ruined. I would actually think, I don't want to ruin this for this family that paid this money to come see this show. I tried to make it less about me. Who cares who's playing bass for Lori Line at the Christmas show? Nobody. The only person that cared about that was me. So what if I made it more about providing a really entertaining, fun experience for the concert goer? That's what got me over it. But it was super embarrassing. Not gonna lie. Thought about quitting in the bass. <laughs> Glad I didn't though. Glad I didn't. Um, all right, here we go. I love this question. What, when you see players that are double your years of experience, what about them inspire you most? I love that. I've been playing for a long time. So people who are double my experience, I mean, I don't know. I don't even know that there are that many of them because I've been playing a long time. But when I think about players who are maybe in their 60s, 70s, even 80s, the, the person that actually came to mind for me was Steve Swallow. And if you don't know Steve Swallow's playing, incredible jazz player who went from playing upright to playing electric bass in the late 60s with a pick. And talk about a difficult road to hoe. Steve Swallow fell in love with the sound of an electric bass. It was actually a Gibson EB2 hollow body with a pick. And so many of his colleagues were like, dude, no, 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 no. And he was like, I, he's like, when I played it, I knew, uh-oh, I'm doomed because I love this sound and I knew that my life was going to be more difficult for it. I love that so much. I love Steve Swallow. He then also said this thing is as he's getting older, I think he's in his 80s now, maybe 70s, late 70s, I'm not sure. He said that his playing, because his hands aren't maybe as able to do fast, tricky, intricate things, he said his playing is getting more useful, is the word he used. His playing, as he gets older, is getting more useful. I love that idea. He's not thinking about blasting licks. He's thinking about supporting, right? He's thinking about playing songs for other people. He's thinking about how best to support this vocalist or this ensemble. His playing is getting more useful. Mm, that's really inspiring to me. I want to be playing the bass and getting more useful in my 80s. All the way, should I live to be 100, I want to be playing bass until I'm 100. Probably should stop eating cheeseburgers and get back on the Peloton, Allison. You probably should. Okay. Mm. Oh, I love this too. I watched Get Back, which is the Beatles doc, and Some Kind of Monster, which is a Metallica documentary. Your thoughts on maturing as a musician. I just watched Get Back. And if you haven't seen it, it's on Disney Plus uh, about the Beatles. It's really made for musicians and fans of the Beatles. Boy, I can't recommend it 
enough. Also, you should absolutely watch some kind of monster. Even if you're not a Metallica fan or whatever, it's another amazing doc. Here's what I'll say. What I, I couldn't believe, I was just talking to my dear friend Eric Hutchinson on the phone about this. I could not believe how much the Beatles just messed around in the studio, dude. They were just playing and they were, they were working, but they also were just having so much fun. And someone would go on a tear and they would all join in. It was like, it was super inspirational. I couldn't believe how much time they just spent on having a blast and playing and goofing around. It created a vibe. That was really inspiring and interesting and sort of strange, to be honest. When I feel like I'm in the studio, it's like, business, we're getting down to brass tacks, we're going to execute, we got to get it in two takes. The Beatles were not in that zone at all. And the thing that I was amazed by, too, is that they were all very friendly to one another, like almost entirely. I mean, there were a couple little things here and there, but you could tell that they really loved one another and they grew up together and that really just came across. And the chemistry of those people and their ability to be in a room together and be smiling and laughing and goofing around together is huge. Now contrast that to the Metallica doc. <laughs> a lot of times they were not in some kind of monster. They were not having a good time, right? They were struggling to invent a new sound. That was when they made uh, Saint Anger. And James uh, went into recovery, right, in the midst of that documentary. They had a band therapist, you guys, that was around talking to them about the different, uh, different issues in the band. The therapist started to submit lyrics. Ah, I died when that started to happen. The therapist starts sneaking notes to Bob Rock, the producer that has lyric suggestions. No. Oh man. But it was very interesting. The, the similarity, there's a lot of differences, but the similarities I saw were bands trying to figure out how to sustain. Now Metallica is still going. The Beatles quit soon after. <laughs> the Beatles were done before any one of those people were 30. You know that? That's insane. Now, Metallica, through all of their bumps and bruises, uh, has maintained and they're still doing their thing. Some Kind of Monster is an amazing doc. You have to see it. It also shows Robert Trujillo joining the band. And it, there's a moment, if, if for no other reason, watch Some Kind of Monster to see them audition all the bass players. It's unbelievable. And to see how much each bass player changes the sound of the band, it will blow your mind. So I don't know, thoughts on maturing as a musician or in a band? Boy, it really is about relationship. It's so much less about, you know, the cool gear, the sounds you're going to bring. It's about how you treat those people and how you get along with those people and how you respect those relationships. It's something that we can all work on, myself included. <laughs> uh, here we go. Love this. What is your improv background like? Have you ever tried to improv with effects? Also, how to improve an improvisation? I just freeze up and end up doing the same predictable bass lines. I will say that for me, I am more of a part player. Um, I'm playing in bands and I'm playing on sessions and I'm playing maybe in event bands. I play a bit at church. And there are a lot of these things that I'm doing are more part-based instead of like jams. I don't do a, a lot of jamming. I'm not in improv settings very often, but when I have been, I've done some. And uh, like I did a really fun thing with Steve Gould uh, and Matt Patrick. Steve Gould's a great drummer and a, a good friend of mine, Matt Patrick, where we were improvising and Matt Patrick was playing samples on a turntable and like, oh, samples on a drum pad. And Steve was playing drums and I was playing bass. And what I like to do is to go into a situation with a few things prepared, not necessarily lines, but a few sounds. So in terms of effects, I use a lot of effects and I like to have maybe three kind of core sounds, maybe like a real uh, trunk rattly octave sound, and then maybe a real nasty distorted fuzz, and then maybe kind of a backward side chaining Wah! kind of sound, right? I kind of like to have three different things that I can call on so that I'm not thinking, uh-oh, I've got to do it all. Oh, I've, I've, oh, oh, I should pull up this sound for this. And I'm, you know, down on the floor scrambling with effects. I'd like to have a bit of parameter 
So I like to choose some constraints for myself. I think if I were going to give anyone, I don't know that I'm qualified to give improv <laughs> like advice, but what has worked for me is to think very simply about what I feel like I'm good at and what I'm not good at and don't try to do the things that I'm not good at. So just playing, uh, if, if I get a solo or there's a moment where like bass breakdown, I'm thinking about one note and rhythm or three notes and rhythm. Right? I'm not thinking about blasting, you know, mixolydian, right? Like, or, or, or playing some kind of like, uh, you know, Lydian dominant. I'm just like, right now I'm doing it. You guys laugh. Right now I'm doing it where I'm like trying to think of mode names to impress you. No, don't do that, Ian, right? So I'm just trying to bring the skill set that I have to any performance. That said, I have to work on all of my jazz licks. I need to go through my two octave modes, especially in harmonic and melodic minor. But I'm not trying to bust that out to fool anyone on the gig. So play what you play. Make it feel good. Make yourself believe it. If you believe it, the audience will believe it. And then just try to get in that environment. Uh, it's also about reps, right? Try to improvise as much as you can. If you want to improvise, put yourself in those situations where you have to do it. And then you're going to learn. And then you're going to hear someone take a solo and you're going to go, oh, I want to get better at this. And then you'll ask them questions and they'll say, oh, you should come around and study or come on to this gig. And, you know, it's just about being in the mix, but don't try to do something you can't do. Hydration. Oh, it's important. It's important, you guys. It's important. How are we doing? How are we doing? We're cruising. We're cruising. Everything's cool. Everything's cool. Here we go. What are your top three bass pedals I should buy? I have no pedals as of yet. I think about this quote from Michael League a lot. Uh, Michael League, who plays in Snarky Puppy, said a wonderful thing once where he said, I will only turn on a pedal when it would be musically irresponsible not to do so. That was kind of a dense sentence. I'm going to say it again. Michael League said, I'm only going to turn on a pedal if it would be musically irresponsible not to turn it on. So if you get to this big moment of a Snarky Puppy tune and it's going... He wants to have a big synthy sound under that, right? It would be musically irresponsible to be playing bridge pickup jazz bass in that moment. Now, this is just about taste, right? This is just about taste. But I think you have to look deep inside and ask yourself, what sounds do you like to make? And then buy those pedals. For me, the three pedals, I'm not going to say a tuner and a DI. I'm not going to do that to you. I'm going to say an octave pedal because I love the way octave pedals sound because they get you close to synth bass territory. I'm going to say some kind of gain device, a fuzz or an overdrive, something to add like harmonic texture to your instrument. Um, and then I'm also going to say uh, a chorus pedal <laughs> because I grew up in the 80s and I love the sound of chorus on bass, especially when it's attached to octave and uh, fuzz bass lines. I think it makes it sound like a dual oscillator synthesizer, and that's something I love. But now let's say that you love country music. You should maybe be buying a spring reverb and a tremolo pedal. Say that you love shoegaze. You should be finding something, you should be finding a fuzz. You say you love incubus. From the early 2000s, you should find a phaser, <laughs> right? Like, it just depends on what you like. And then ask questions. Like, if you like something, type into Google, what effects did so-and-so use on this tune? And you're going to find it. But for me, octave, overdrive fuzz, that's a one. <laughs> octave, an overdrive or a fuzz pedal, and then a chorus pedal. Those are my three. Oh, here we go. These questions, you guys, are so delightful. Are the short scale basses on their 15 minutes, presumably 15 minutes of fame? I mean, tasty high notes, but that open E, yikes. Are 32 inch scales or long scale basses better? Let me say this, yes. Yes, they are on, short scale basses are definitely popular right now. now 
15 minutes of fame, do you do, are you asking me if they're going to fade and fall away? Maybe a little bit, but short scale basses have always been dope. I mean, they're just a lot of sort of like high profile players playing them now, I guess. Maybe Tim LaFave is playing them a bit. Who else? Rob Malarkey from Jacob Collier's band is playing them. And people are talking about them a lot. High notes sound so nice and have, are they're full of bass content on short scale basses, but I hear you, the open strings, especially the open E can be a little tubby. Um, I just think it's not like one is better than the other. And I, I think that 32 inch scale, there've been so many um, makers that have tried that. 32 inch scales like Kubicki and I said so many, Kubicki is the only one I can think of. Um, but I feel like, no, uh, I don't think that a 32 is better. I think you need both, to be honest. I think if you've never played a short scale, you got to try one. At least try one and see. They're so cool, and they're so cool for the right thing. Hofner vibe with the Beatles. I mean, amazing. A Starfire, incredible. Uh, a Wilcock Malarkey, amazing. I have a Vorin Saku bass. My signature bass is a short scale, and I love it. Now, is it perfect for everything? No. But is it perfect for short scale things? Yes. And those things are like when you're wanting to play up high a little bit on the neck and have those notes feel full and big, and you're not thinking about playing subterranean, low, you know, five string bombs. Uh, just think about it as every note you play on a short scale bass is going to sound bassy. And that's cool. That's so cool. So I love them. Uh, Oh, here we go. A lot of you ask this. What is the best electric bass for entry-level player like me? Here's the thing. I'm not going to tell you a particular model or anything. I'm going to tell you I'm going to tell you this. Your tastes are going to change inevitably, so I think you need to get a bass that you think is cool. I'm going to say it again. Get a bass that you think is cool. Does it look cool? Do you want to pick it up every time you see it? Are you like, yes. The main thing you have to do when you start is play the bass. So what is going to motivate you to play the bass? Is it the action? Maybe take it to a tech and get the action set up nice so that it's a little bit easier to play, right? Is it the color? That's okay. It's okay to pick an instrument based on the color. It's totally fine. In the beginning, you just need to pick it up. If a pink bass is what you need to pick it up, buy the pink bass. Get something that you are excited about, not something that everyone tells you to get. Um, that said, P basses are great, jazz basses are great, boring. But whatever, dude, get something that you are excited about, even if that means it's pointy and you know what I'm saying? Like, whatever. Get something that's gonna make you wanna pick it up. That's my answer. I'm sticking to it. I'm starting to regret it. I don't care, I'm gonna move on. Were you formally educated in music or self-taught? If so, where did you go to school? Check it out. I joined a band when I was 13 with my dear friend, David Young, who I mentioned as one of my biggest influences. He taught me so much. And when I went to college, I didn't go for music. I went to McAllister College in St. Paul, Minnesota. And I didn't go for music because I was already doing the thing that I wanted to do, which I was in a band and we were going to dominate the world, dude. Did we dominate the world? We did not dominate the world, but we had so much fun and I wouldn't change it for anything. So I went to school because I was worried that if the band didn't work out and I didn't have what it takes, that I would need something to fall back on. Now that said, I don't regret that, but I do wish I would have taken maybe more music or dug into the music community at McAllister College more than I did. Um, but I ended up picking stuff up. I studied with a few different teachers over the years. Um, and I was really hungry for knowledge. I took one lesson with Brian Bromberg, who's an amazing session bass player, kind of like a smooth jazz bass player in LA. And he got me thinking about theory. And from there, I bought a bunch of books and I dug way in uh, and, and really was mostly self-taught. And then had a couple of good teachers in college as well. But I'm kind of mostly a self-taught guy. Yeah. Um, whew, how about this? Nolly calls you. Nolly Get Good, formerly of the band Periphery. Excellent producer, guitar player, bass player. Nolly calls you to record on the next Periphery album. What is your approach as a session player? <laughs> Gulp. 
Big Swallow, first of all. First of all, Nolly, if you ever call me, I will prep that music so hard and I will come in and crush! I don't know that I'm necessarily the right call for that gig, but oh, I do have a lot of roots in prog and metal music. I would really love an opportunity to play that kind of music meaningfully on a record. I would love it. My approach would be to study hard. My approach would be to learn all of the guitar riffs, actually, because there, if I learned melodies and guitar riffs, so if, if there was a vocal melody, like if it wasn't all scream, and if there was vocal melody, I would learn those melodies on the bass, and I would learn all of the guitar riffs. And then I would have that as bass line. I would understand the song because of the guitar riffs and because of the melody, and then it would be easy, easy, quote unquote, easy to double the guitar riffs because I've learned them. But with that as a jumping off point, that might inspire me to make different choices and come up with slightly different parts. So, uh, hey, if anyone calls me, if anyone calls you to play on a record, the best thing to do is learn that material. If you have it in advance, learn that material front and back, even come up with a few options. You start to hear things as you learn songs, you start to hear other options. They come to you, right? And then as you prepare that material, you'll get more ideas, write them down, record voice notes in your phone or iPad or whatever. And then you'll show up and you'll be super prepped and you will crash. And then periphery will be like, yo, join the band. And you'll be like, I would be honored. That's what I would do. Um, here we go. Did the opportunity to play in church contribute to your style and approach to playing other gigs? Yes. I have played in a couple of different churches quite a bit over the years. In fact, I still play at one church. I have a Sunday night church service that I play at. I've played at it for like 15 years. It's called Upper Room. It's in Minneapolis, Edina, technically, suburb. I love it. It's with wonderful people. It is a very, very progressive, incredible church. Um, and I love it very much. I've played at a lot of other churches too, most notably Eagle Brook Church, which is a big, like multi-site mega church. And the thing that I was amazed by, I was raised loosely Christian, but I was not in evangelical culture at all. And I was kind of actually, my parents were, uh, they dragged evangelical culture a lot. They thought it was culty. And there are aspects of it that are. <laughs> they weren't 100% wrong. But I found that when I would engage with people in, even in evangelical church culture, I found so many lovely people to be very honest. Um, I don't always agree politically um, or agree even morally, but I found the people that I engaged with to be wonderful. And I've made some really, really, really good friends in those spaces. Uh, if I go down the road of thinking about what church gave me, I used to do a thing where I would play on Wednesday nights for student ministries where, and it would be kind of like, almost like synth bangers. There was this movement out of Australia, Hillsong Church, and there was like a youth movement that was almost like techno, it was electronic music and all of these synth bass lines. And I really cut my teeth on making a lot of those sounds in a church environment, playing for students on Wednesday nights. It was amazing. It was amazing. It's also the place that I learned how to deal with in-ears. I learned how to mix my own, you know, mix and my in-ears on my little personal mixer. I learned how to show up on time, right? I did some BGVs in that world. I started, I learned how to use Ableton and I started to MD, learned how to put tracks together, learned how to lead a band, at not like a dick, because before that I was just in my own band of friends and was, you know, maybe not the best people person. It gave me so much. And what I want to say is if you have the opportunity, there are two worlds out there that are absolutely um, talked down upon by other musicians. And it is event band or wedding band spaces and church band spaces. Like, event or wedding band musicians, church band musicians, people talk about it in these like, oh yeah, church gig, oh, I've got a wedding gig. Oh. And, and sometimes people will talk about it um, disparagingly and, and then it's like not cool, you know, if you're doing those things. Boy, I couldn't feel further from that. I think both of those spaces have given me so much. They, uh, Jonathan Marin said when he was playing in a wedding band, Jonathan Marin, a great bass player, he said it would battle harden you. And that is so true. So 
I gained so much and I'm still, I still do uh, my upper room uh, service every Sunday night. I was going to say gig, but I don't think of it as a gig. It's like a really meaningful place to me. My family goes there. I really love it very much. And playing the music is wonderful. So if you have always thought like, oh, I kind of want to play in a cover band or like, oh, I kind of want to play at church, but there are people like your homies are like, no, that's stupid. Don't do it. Real musicians don't. Miles Davis never had a church gig. I don't, I don't know. Maybe he did. Maybe he didn't. It doesn't matter. If those things sound good to you, you will find a ton of value in doing them. So do them if you want to. Mm. How about this? What kind of logic processing, not, not here, but I think computer, I think you mean logic, the program on a Macintosh, are you using to get bass that clear on phone speakers? Check it out. I do a lot of videos for Instagram um, or with mobile devices in mind. So something, a quick tip, if you're trying to make your bass stand out a little more on a, a laptop speaker or a phone speaker, it's about compression and it's about a slight roll off of the low end so that you're not taking up a ton of space that a phone speaker just can't reproduce. Maybe even a couple of bumps in the mid range around 400 to 600 in that neck of the woods. Um, those things really help. Compression, a little bit of low end roll off, which seems counterintuitive and a bit of a bump in the mid range. I also, here's another little hot tip. I use just a touch of stereo room reverb in Logic to make the bass feel like it's sort of sitting in a space. I think that helps it sound big on a laptop or on phone speakers, even in headphones. I think a little bit of reverb on bass actually helps it. And not a lot, not a long tail. I'm not talking ambient music. I'm just talking a little bit of, it sounds almost like it's being played in a room, like a short room reverb really helps a lot. It's a good question. Thanks. Mm, how about this? How have you embraced having to do a little of everything to make a career out of music. Uh, it's scary, but you got to do it. Beginning of COVID. Check this out. Beginning of COVID, you guys. Scott Devine is like, hey, man, can you get into a studio to record some stuff? I said, no, everything is closed. He said, what if uh, we send you a light? It's the light I'm using right now. And, and would you do it yourself? And I thought, oh, dear God, because I didn't know anything about lighting, about videography, right? I still really don't, but I dove in. Yeah, you got to do a little bit of everything, for sure. If you want to, <laughs> I mean, right, unless, unless you're like the most ferocious talent um, and, and you're out there just crushing it and people think you're a virtuoso and you have this amazing band and you're an incredible songwriter. And, right, but, if you're, but if you're like me... <laughs> <laughs> of average talent, you need to dig into a bunch of things. Um, I taught for a lot of years. I mean, I'm still teaching on SBL, right? Um, I've done all kinds of different gigs, different styles of music. I've learned how to record myself, right? I've learned how to be comfortable facing camera talking. I mean, I'm just in, I'm just in my spare bedroom right now, you guys, talking to no one, talking to you, but right now I'm talking to no one. <laughs> essentially monologuing for an hour or whatever, right? Get comfortable setting up a light. Get comfortable with a microphone, right? <laughs> setting up a microphone. Uh, and, and, you know, you will be so surprised if you branch out a little bit um, what other opportunities that may lead you to. Those are just mine, right? I, I only play the bass. I'm not really playing guitar, drums, or keys. Or, I'm not a good singer. Um, I'm not really a great songwriter, but I can do some of those other tech things, right? I can teach, I can speak, uh, I can play the bass. <laughs> and those are the things that I've really leaned into. Oh, I love this one. Ready? Describe your ideal setup as a bassist who travels the world all of the time. Now look. Are you saying that you think I'm a bass player that travels the world all the time? Because if you are saying that, thank you so much. Is not true, though. Not true. I'm not traveling the world all the time, but I do love to travel in pre-COVID. Oh, my God. I loved being on the road. Um, not for too long because I have a family, but boy, when I got an opportunity to travel, uh, I was so excited. So um, check it out. Follow up here says, um, so... Describe your ideal setup in terms of self-recording and live. I mean, you know, what? Like maybe you've got this amazing gig and you get to bring your all your bases and your rig and da 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 da, da. Really, what it is for me 
is its simplicity. If I close my eyes and I think about my ideal thing, no matter what band I was in, no matter what budget I had, I would want to have one or two instruments that I can carry myself. And I want to have one backpack, not a roller suitcase, you guys. I don't know if you've done a deep dive on me at all. You know, I'm a light packer. I'm way into minimal travel, way into it. I want to have one backpack and I want to have one base, maybe two bases. In that backpack, there's going to be clothes. There's going to be a really minimal pedal board setup. There's going to be a uh, very minimal like hair care because I don't have any hair, you guys. You can just shave it all off. It's all good. Um, I travel with very, I pack very, very light. And I delight in that so that I can put on my base, put on my backpack and roll. I can get on a train. I can get on a plane. I can get on a boat. I can show up to the gig. I can walk around a city all day. I love traveling light. I always bring a tiny little recording interface, my computer, happy to do tracks from the road. I love that. So my ideal setup is something that I can carry myself. Now, of course, if there's a big pedal board for a specific gig or a big amp or whatever, that's going to go maybe with the crew. But I love just having one instrument, small, minimal pedal setup, small recording setup, closed toiletries. I am good to go. That's my ideal. And I've done it before too. I did, I did like a 10 week tour with just a backpack with clothes and toiletries and stuff. And it was unbelievable. I would really recommend trying that if you haven't already. Uh, how can I transcribe a bass line being a noob bass player? Is it even possible? Yes. That is going to uh, dovetail into this question. Exercise or tip for building creative bass lines. Here it is. Transcribing, writing bass lines. It's about getting skills together, understanding vocabulary. Think about it as the English language. It's just a language, okay? It's no different than learning a language. You have to learn how to speak the language. So that's getting some of your facility together, your technique, just being able to finger some very simple scale things, right? Not knowing all the modes, not knowing all the things, but maybe scales and triads, very basic elements of theory. And then, you know what it really is about? It's about singing. It's about listening to tons of music, and it's about singing. Not like a beautiful singing voice, but matching pitch of your voice to your instrument. So if you hear an idea, you've learned a little bit of facility on the instrument, you hear the idea, you can go, oh, boom. You can grab it on the bass. I can see that layout on my bass as I sing it, right? And that is the freedom that I think we're all moving toward. That's the freedom that I want and even greater access to. But you have that everyone has a voice and everyone can learn how to ear train and match pitch. So if you hear the note, boom, doom, 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 find it on your bass. Doom, 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 and then you hear a boom, doom, 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 you doom, 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 find it on your bass. Try to match the things, the notes on your bass to the things that you're hearing. And when you hear something, the best way to internalize it is to hum it or sing it. I know that sounds scary, but you can do that. That's how I write bass lines too. The best way to write a bass line, I think, is to put the bass down. Put it in a stand, put it on your lap, listen to the thing that you need to write the baseline for, and imagine what baseline you wish existed there. Now that is going to rely on all the music that you've listened to, your life experience, everything. But that's the best thing to do. That is the best way to write a baseline, as opposed to picking up your bass and just, you know, shedding a bunch of licks. No! Put it down. Sing the baseline that you wish existed in the song. That's my best advice for writing a baseline. Oh, great question. Should we all go five string to be more effective in our role as a bass player? No. <laughs> but again, I'm playing a five string gig tomorrow. It's Christmas music that leans in the sort of like R&B and funk direction. And the original bass player, Sonny Thompson, woo, Sonny T, plays with Corey Wong. He played all the bass on the records. And I am going to be doing my poor man's version of Sonny Thompson. You got to have a five to play Sonny. So it's just about awareness. Do you have to have a five? Should we all ditch our four strings and get a five? Absolutely not, because it's not the right thing for every gig. But if it's the right thing for your gig at church, the gospel band, the R&B band, or if you just dig it or the metal band tunes down really low, 
Five strings are amazing, but no, you don't have to all transition to a five. It's just, it's a lane. It's a flavor. Think about that. It. It's not better, good or bad. It's just another lane. And if you're intrigued by it, get one and play a five. They're amazing. Feeling a low B in like a PA system or through a big amp, it's intoxicating. It's nothing better than that. If you love it, do it. Cool? Cool. Mm, we're going to go. Here we go. <laughs> uh, good or bad instrument cable? Is it a myth? Here's the thing that I care about with instrument cables the most. I want it to look and feel great. I actually don't really care how they sound. Maybe they sound different, but I want them to look and feel great. I also love right angles, right? So I want the right length. I want it to look good. I want it to feel good when I grab it and pull it out of the bag. I want it to coil up easily when I plug it in. I want it to go click in a satisfying way. I use three different companies' cables. There's a guy named Dave Lowe who makes x base cables in Minneapolis, and he makes such excellent cables. He can make all kinds of different things. They lean kind of in the more like utilitarian side. If you want a little bit more branding and panache, Caulfield cables, Asher makes these amazing Caulfield, C-A-U-L-F-I-E-L-D on Instagram. Oh man, so beautiful, wrapped in this, all these beautiful colors. And then at the whippy end, they're expensive, but boy, are they artful and cool. My boy Ben at Ray Ray Decker, whew, man, makes some really cool cables with some like wood ends that are sometimes hand painted. Oh, and if you care about aesthetic like I do, man, it's, they're pretty great. He has these really cool artists, Laura Bennett being one of them, who worked at Zvex for a long time, who paints these ends of the cables, and they're very beautiful. But I don't actually care necessarily about how they sound. I feel like if you're buying one of those, like a cable that is a, a, good, a good quality cable, it's going to sound great. I just, I want it to look and feel great. That's shallow, but it's true. Um, here we go. You are both killer players with a lot of bases. Does gear really matter at the end of the day? Thank you for that. I assume when you're saying you're both killer players, you are talking to the co-host, my boss of the Scott and Ian show, Mr. Scott Devine. Scott is indeed a killer player. I love this question. Does gear really matter at the end of the day? Scott could show up with uh, a Squire P bass with any set of strings on it, with any action, and crush a gig. I would like to think that I could do the same. So does it matter in terms of, um, oh, are people really going to notice if I'm playing uh, a vintage Fender versus an American Standard, you know, with a price difference of thousands of dollars? No, it doesn't matter in that regard. Here's where gear matters. So, no, it doesn't matter to most people. Like Scott or I could show up to something with a budget instrument and make it work just fine. Where it matters to me, and I bet my boss would say the same thing, it's about inspiration to me. I love good gear. I love a beautiful setup. I like the right strings, I, you know, the right bass for the vibe. If I'm playing like a rock band and I've got my Thunderbird, ooh, yes! It feels so good. And I love that. So, so for me, it's about inspiration. I'm choosing gear that delights me when I plug into it. And does it make it better? I don't know, 3% better maybe, but that's enough for me. I also love the people that build gear. I love craftsmanship, right? I love building relationships with manufacturers that build cool stuff. I think it's honestly unbelievable that there are people out there that dedicate their lives to making like a DI, like Jack Roan from Noble, or making a pedal, like the design team at Jim Dunlap, or like making picks. I mean, I am so thankful for that stuff because I can't do it. So I'm so thankful that there are. So then I, I get into the relationship and I want to support those people because I think it's incredible that people are making amazing tools uh, that I get to use for my job. Ah! It's the best. So that's why gear matters to me. It's about relationship and it's about how I feel when I use it. Will it sound any better? I, 
I've got a bunch of basses in this room. If I played them all, you'd probably, and you were blindfolded, you'd probably say, those all sort of sound like a bass. It's like old Bob Allison, man. My dad, old Bob Allison, would say, oh, God, Ian, don't basses just kind of all go boom, boom, boom? <sighs> He's not wrong. <laughs> but I play it because I love it. Full stop. Um, minimum, and, and here's another question that relates to that. Minimum gear rig needed for a poor newbie to put themselves out there professionally. Doesn't really matter. Get a bass that you like to play, that you like the sound of. If you're doing a gig that needs an amp, get a get a small or medium-sized amp that can compete with a drummer. Ask around, see if you can borrow something first to see how it works. But no, you don't need a big pedal board and a beautiful, amazing amp and a bunch of different basses. Get yourself, make sure your bass is in tune. Make sure you have a nice sound that you like. Plug into an amp. Or if it's a DI, you know, get a very utilitarian DI. Radial makes some good stuff. You don't have to get a Noble. They're a thousand bucks. Wait, wait and see if that's something you really want to invest in. Who cares, right? But, but the best thing you can do is prepare the material. Like you can show up with any brand and quality of bass. If $50 Amazon bass, I don't even know if that exists, $150 Amazon bass. And as long as you know that material and you kill it, no one is going to pay any attention to the bass that you play. Now let's flip that. Uh-oh, you just showed up to the gig with an $8,000 Fodera, but you haven't put any time in. Guess who's going to get the gig? Yes, dude! $150 Amazon base guy every time. Every time. Don't worry about their gear too much. Uh, how about this? What's the most efficient way to practice for a beginner to intermediate player? Check this out. I'm going to get... <laughs> We're going to do a, a quick, it's not a deep dive, it's a shallow dive, but here's what I would say. The most efficient way to practice is splitting up your practice time into three 15-minute segments. The first 15, you focus on timekeeping, metronome exercises. I do this, I do it real slow. Maybe playing slow half notes to a click. Maybe they'll speed it up a little bit, but I don't get fast. I focus on time and I settle in and I close my eyes and I think about the beat as a ball that I cut straight through the middle with my note. I envision that. It becomes my Zen time. I love it very much. The second 15 is about practicing something difficult. Maybe it's a theoretical thing that you're trying to get a handle on. Maybe it's inversions through all the chords. Maybe it's, you know, root three, five, seven through a jazz standard. It's something that is going to challenge you. It's difficult. It's maybe theory or technique based. And then your reward, the back 15 is creativity. You're going to maybe take those two things that you've worked on and combine them. Maybe try to write something. Maybe you're going to plug in that pedal. Maybe you're going to turn on some music and just jam along. Whatever you feel like gets the creative juices flowing or whatever feels like um, a reward for you is your last 15. So timekeeping, theory, eat that broccoli without the cheese. And then you get the cheese at the end, you guys, which is reward yourself with something that you enjoy doing. And think about your practice regimen instead of drudgery. I would need you to start thinking about it as self-care. It's so much more about, think about it as it's time that you have carved out for you. Do you have a family? Do you have children? Do you have a, a job that's super stressful? Do you feel like there aren't enough hours in the day? Do you wish there were a cloning device? that could clone you? Do, you, do you? do you need to work out, but you haven't prioritized it, right? Carve out, if you can carve out 45 minutes for yourself, not to like, oh, I should practice the base. No, 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 my friends. 45 minutes for you. Oh, it's a gift. It's a gift. So, what I would say. I'm really into it. I don't do it as much as I should, but I'm, I'm really into it. When I do, I always feel really happy that I've done it. Uh, here we go. Just, hey, here's a quote. Just find out how to do it on YouTube. Hey, man. Ah. Lessons? Just find out how to do it on YouTube. Is this a good or bad statement for musical development? Well, it depends. It depends. It's good if you've already developed. So I love YouTube because if I'm playing a tune and I'm like, I wonder how so-and-so would approach this, I can find it on YouTube, 
right? But if I were starting out, it's so hard because there's so many things. There's all this information out there. And the reason that a school or an online education 360 degree platform like SBL, shameless plug, I don't care. I don't care because I believe in it. The reason that you would sign up for SBL or the reason that you would take lessons or go to college is not for the information. The information is out there. It's for the curation of the information and it is for accountability and it is for the community. So there's probably an acronym that I'm missing right here, but look, it's about how that the trajectory and curation of that information. Let's go with trajectory. The trajectory, right? The information is collected and given to you in a way that makes sense to you where you're at, right? Then it's about accountability. Hey, is there a group that you've joined maybe? A college class, there's grading, you've spent money. There's accountability there, right? There's no accountability on YouTube. It just feels fun to watch a YouTube video. There's no one holding you accountable. And then community. Are there people, a part of the platform or in the college, that you feel like you can lean on or ask questions to that will support you, right? Trajectory, accountability, Community, tack, let's flip it. Community, accountability, trajectory, cat. I don't know, but so important. That's why going to a music school, enrolling in something like SBL is more meaningful than just trying to do it on your own. I wish that I would have had more access to that or that I would have prioritized that more coming up. Now that I'm a professional bass player, I still really get a lot out of a platform like SBL, but I find that I can cherry pick things off of YouTube more easily. But if you're just coming up, do not buy a DVD or go on YouTube and try to learn how to play this instrument on your own. It will not work. I could be wrong. Flame me. I might be wrong, but it is a very slim chance. Your chances are so much better if you have curated trajectory, you have accountability, and you have community. Big time. <laughs> uh, last question, then I'm going to dig into a couple of rapid fire. So no, 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 not last question, but we're getting there. We're getting there. You guys, this has been so fun. It's been so much fun for me. I love this. You can only pick two bases. What would they be? And then also, Desert Island Base, no fenders. <laughs> Two-part question. Desert, uh, okay, I can only pick two bases. What would they be? Immediately, my mind goes to my two favorite jazz bases. I have a 1968 jazz bass. It's over there. I'm not going to go get it because you've, you've maybe seen it on Instagram or on SBL. It's sunburst. It's trashed. It always wears flats. I love it so much. Every note sounds honest and beautiful and thuddy. And it's like an old man that has just like lived through some shit. Do you know what I'm saying? My 68 jazz bass is like an old man who has been through some shit, but has come out the other side and is better for it. I play a G on that bass and that bass is like, yep, I played this G a lot of times. And I love that about it. The second one is my Antigua jazz bass. I've got it right here so I can pull it up. Yes. 78. Antigua jazz always wears rounds. This is the bass that I learned how to think about hearing a jazz bass with. It's the best bass that I have ever played for me. Maybe not for you. It's heavy. It has huge neck pocket gaps. The pickups are weak. There are other basses that sound way better. But for me, it's like the best bass. I don't know why. Maybe because I spent the most time with it. I bonded with it, right? Second part of the question, on the island, no fenders. Then I am going to pick my Vorinsaku, Ian Martin Allison's signature bass. Now you might be like, oh, lame, dude. Your signature bass? Lame. It's not lame. This is one of the best basses I've ever played in my life. Saku Viore from Vorinsaku Guitars built this for me. It is incredible. It's a cross between a jazz bass and a bass six. It's short scale. It's the best short scale bass I have ever played. When I play it, it has this beautiful neck profile. Oh, all the notes leap off of it. Every note sounds even. It's, I don't have it plugged in right now. Um, oh my gosh, it's amazing. I love it so much. So if no fenders are allowed, I'm taking my bass, the one that was made for me from Saku Viore, from Vorin Saku Guitars. I'm trying too hard, trying too hard with that. Um, all right, 
Here we go. You guys, so fun. A few rapid fire questions. If I didn't get to your question, I'm so sorry. I might do another Q&A uh, in Instagram. You can ask me there. I'm very available there if you want to chat with me. I try to get to every DM. Also, don't you think Scott should do a Q&A podcast on his own as well? Or maybe I should shoot him questions and he should answer. That might be really fun. I could host it. Um, or he could do it on his own because he's a very capable man. He's a very capable British man. Farm boy. Did you know that? Grew up on the farm. Dude's got skills. He's got farm skills and city skills. That's rare. That's rare to have both. Scott's got it both. Um, hey, rapid fire. <laughs> Here we go. HX stomp presets. When? Soon. I'm working with a guy, Rob Morgan. I'm working with you. I'm sorry that I haven't answered your emails. Ah! Soon. Very soon. Hopefully early 2022. Flats, rounds, or tapes? I would say all of them. I love rounds and flats, tapes. I have tapes on one base, but look, strings, you just got to try them. There's so many different kinds of strings. It's the first thing you make contact with. It's the, it's such an important thing. So check out strings. This, this probably should have been in the main body. This is less rapid fire than I wanted it to be. Round wounds are amazing. Flat wounds are amazing. I love Dunlop strings. I love their flats and rounds. Super bright nickels are amazing. I also love Fender flats. They're incredible. Those are my favorite strings. The Dunlop super bright nickels, the Dunlop flats, and also Fender flats. Love those strings. Um, <laughs> John Davis asked me this. When do we get to hang out and play with pedals again? John Davis, you are a saint and I love you so much and I hope soon. If no one knows, if you don't know who John Davis is, he plays bass with Jojo Mayer and the band Nerve. He is a pioneer of effects and synth sounds on the electric bass. And if you like the stuff that I do, get ready to have your mind blown by the band Nerve. Go check out John Davis is playing with Nerve. John you even asking me this question made my fucking day. So thank you. I hope we get to hang again and play pedals. I was in New York hanging with John not too long ago, and it was a delight. Hello from Texas. Beef or pork ribs? I don't know the difference between the two, and that's sad. So please, when I, please, I, I would like to come to Texas and experience both. I don't know. Favorite bass YouTuber? Mm, should I say my boss? No! I'm not going to say my boss because that's some kiss-ass stuff. I'm going to say Adam Neely. Adam Neely. If you don't know Adam Neely, check him out. He is far more than just a bass player. He is a musician through and through, makes incredible content. Um, but yeah, your boy. I mean, also, I loved Scott Devine and Marlo DK when I was coming up. Ooh, those are my original favorite YouTubers, Scott and Marlo. And then Adam Neely is my current favorite. Um how many guitars do you take to a club or simple wedding gig? One. Don't be the person that brings too many basses and makes the band wait while you change to your fretless for, uh, for Diamonds on the Soles of Her Shoes. Don't do that. Play one instrument. That's what I do anyway. Just take one. Did you let the dog out? We're ending the podcast with my wife, the Sub, Emily Allison. My poor dog, Jack has been peeing up a storm lately. He's a thousand years old, 15 years old. She asked me, she just asked me, did you let the dog out? I did not. I should probably go do that. You guys, this has been so fun. Thank you very much for sitting through all of these wonderful questions, um, listening to me answer them to the best of my abilities. Thank you so much for asking these questions. Doing this podcast for me has been a delight to get to know myself better, to get to know you all a little better when I interface with you, when you comment on the podcast, and of course, to get to know Scott better. Hey, thank you so much for listening. I've been Ian Martin Allison for the Scott and Ian Show. I am sure that Scott is going to be back next week. Peace, everybody. Thanks so much. Bye.